So uh, welcome, namaste, welcome to satsang, happy new year to you all. Just checking everyone can hear me okay before we, yep, good, good. It's always good to make sure. <clears throat> So um, in the last satsang that we had, uh, which was, um, I was really trying to focus on uh, what the most important thing to focus on is. And I want to dive a little deeper into that, this uh, satsang that we have here to hopefully clarify a little bit even more about the, the fastest way, the way that really worked for me and what I basically said um, last satsang was that the only choice we have, the only free will we have in any moment <clears throat> is where our attention is. Is it on that part of us that is moving, changing and growing and becoming, which also includes the seeker, the seekingness, the trying to get somewhere? Or is it on that part of us that is... Um, <clears throat> uh, flawless already, that is already stable, that it's already permanent, is unchanging and is already here now. So am I focusing in any particular moment on that which is already free, happy, peaceful, complete, worthy, all of that? Or am I focusing on that aspect of myself, manifestation, uh, that is becoming and striving to get somewhere because that really is the only thing we have any control over. And when I began to really uh, get that, grasp that on a deeper level, it became clear that that was the most important thing, that only thing I could really ever control was how much, how strong, how burning my desire was to know that formless aspect of my being, that aspect that is everywhere at all times, in all places. <clears throat> and to know it with such an utter clarity and conviction, a depth of certainty that was unshakable by anything that happened in my life at all or could happen, even and including the end of the physical body. That became very important, very, very urgent for me at some point. And that's the reason that you're listening to these words also, because at some point, or maybe right now, uh, there's an urgency developing that somehow, some way, I just have to know that. I have to know myself in the entirety of what that means. And it's not a one-time event. It's deepening for me every day, that urgency, that desire, that... Um, I'm going to use the word need, but it's not really a need, uh, fire to know what I am, no matter how much is revealed to me about myself, which also includes all of you, of course. That fire never goes out, it gets stronger, which seems paradoxical, um, <clears throat> but it actually is really what we're talking about is love, isn't it? Love of the self, love of myself, love of yourself love of everything that is and could be and will be and was and all of that. And <clears throat> what I'd like to try to uh, speak about today is really how to come to know that. What are the things that really made a difference for me in terms of coming to this unshakable um, unstoppable recognition that never left me no matter what occurred and the first one of those I spoke about last time and that is where is my attention in any moment I can tell how strong my desire is by how much time I spend curious about uh, what I really am what reality really is and I can tell how much I'm caught up still in my illusions by how often my mind drifts off to other people, other things, other places, other issues that aren't um, a recognition directly of what I really am. And really, you could kind of segment our thinking process 
into uh, two, can, you could be segmented into, uh, sometimes I'm thinking about what it is to be infinite. And sometimes I'm thinking about what it is to be finite and limited and separate. And when I looked at my thought process, as I began to recognize my attention was drifting more and more to what was most important to me, which is what I really am, that wasn't just living in a thought-free place. So we could uh, get into a recognition of the infinite silence of our being right now, spend time as that silence. And what happens after that? Where isn't the majority of my thought process going, my contemplation going? Because we're always in contemplation of something and we're always inquiring about something. And we always have control over what we're inquiring about. So whether I direct my attention to inquiring about the truth or not is up to me. And just to be able to pay more attention to what am I thinking about here also? There's nothing wrong with thoughts. It's not the goal or the um, end point of awakening to stop all thoughts, but really to come to a place where thoughts are a secondary tool that you use when you want to. So are you doing that right now? Is your mind stream this constant um talkingness that mind does is it being directed on purpose or is it just running off on autopilot is if we let our mind run off on autopilot it's going to think about it's going to reinforce recreate problems that appear to be real as a separate being so firstly where is my attention is it on what is real or what is unreal and when it's on what is unreal, can I change it back? Can I move it back? There are um, certain skill sets that every sage or awakened being has um, developed within them through a process of uh, constant reaffirmation of these skill sets. They can be developed by anyone at any time, but there has to be within that um, a sense of focusing on it. So here are the skill sets that really I developed within my own self when I recognized that they were important. And you might recognize, uh, as I'm saying this, certain places in your own uh, journey where these could become stronger within your own self. So first of all, as I said, attention. Where is your attention most of the time? Or perhaps Clara said, where is your attention when you have free time? So <clears throat> outside of your formal meditation, outside of your job, outside of anything that needs to use your mind to, you know, that you need to focus on to do that. When you have some spare time, what are you focusing on? And when I looked at this myself, 100% of my spare time at first, my attention was on phenomena. So I was thinking about things, other beings, things that I thought were separate to me. So it's the first thing I began to develop, this first skill set, the habit of cultivating attention back, putting attention back, checking in, where is my attention right now? What am I thinking about? What is it on? Is it on the background of all experiences? Or is it on a particular experience? And then secondly, am I cultivating an attitude of challenging the thoughts that everyone else takes for granted? And for me, this became also all consuming. What thoughts am I believing that the sages have actually really deeply questioned and challenged? Because if I do the same as they have done, I will get the same results as they've got. And we might have come to see in our inquiry, in our meditation, uh, through putting attention on the formlessness, that we are actually formless, that we're not someone. We might have seen that several times, lots of times. But then where does my attention go after that? Do I go back out of habits 
to thinking about other beings, other things, things that I think are outside of me, separate to me that I need to get, things that I think are inside me, like emotions and that I'm trying to get rid of. Am I thinking about other beings most of the time? Am I thinking about myself as a separate being most of the time with just these brief momentary um, points where I'm thinking about myself as the formlessness, I'm experiencing myself as formlessness. So we can all sit here and have a massive breakthrough. You could have a massive epiphany right now that you're not separate to anything, nor could you ever be. And the only thing that ever existed was you in all your myriad of appearances, that you are Shiva, you are Krishna and all of that. And then 10 minutes after satsang finishes, your mind is caught back up again in thinking about another being, an other being that you're having a challenge with. And of course, we're all doing this. There's no judgment here. I did this too. And this is why I'm talking about it now to kind of stress the importance of thinking on purpose. When your mind is thinking, you can direct it to what you want to think about. If you suddenly become aware that you're thinking about something that you think is separate to you in that moment, you can redirect that. You can change that. Is this being really separate to me, actually? Is this problem real for me as the self? Do I have to uh, invest energy and time thinking about this? So just checking in during your day, looking at where your thinking process is, what was your thought process about? And just stemming that flow if you can in that moment. I'd like to think more about the formlessness and I'd like to become more curious about what thoughts I'm still believing. And of course, we talk often in satsang about the thoughts that we all believe that I'm not safe, that I'm not good enough, that I'm a separate being, all of that, that we are struggling to overcome through our contemplation. But then this brings us to these few last assumptions that hardly anybody ever questions. And this is the third skill that I had to develop to challenge the thoughts that nobody else wants to challenge because they're just assumed to be true. So right now, whether we realize it or not, unless we've already looked at this, we are all believing that there are such categories as form and formless, that those are two different things. We might believe that the objects in the room are actually sitting inside the formlessness, that there are two categories. There's forms and then there's a the formlessness, that there are two different things. And to uphold and sustain that assumption, we have to believe that the formlessness comes to an end. Where there's a form, so where my hand is, there's no formlessness. It's somehow displacing the emptiness of my being. Or we might believe that there are two things here. There's the formless space of my being and a human body sitting in that space. These are the ideas that hardly anybody questions. Can there be two categories of things in the same place? These are really, uh, these ideas are de so deeply ingrained into our human consciousness that even once we have seen, as it was the same for me, that I'm not actually a thing. I am not a thing. I am the field. I am the emptiness. I am that which has no shape or definition, or any of that. I am not limited. You know, I am the infinite space of being. It still didn't occur to me that I was believing. If I was thinking about other beings and other things, then I was still agreeing that that infinite consciousness ended somewhere and something else, someone else began, that there was a break, a line, a dividing point between me and another being that my formlessness ended somewhere so cultivating a habit of where to put your attention and 
cultivating a second habit of where to uh, direct your thinking. And then this third and final one that became so important for me was uh, to finally push through all ideas of limitation. Do I actually know what formlessness is? Am I still imagining it has an end somewhere? And if I'm thinking about believing in having challenges with other beings or things, then the answer to that is not as fully as I could do. Have I seen through this idea that formlessness can come to an end where an object begins? Or this last idea of all, that all these forms arose out of the formlessness and they're actually different to and separate from the formlessness. How often do we challenge that idea in our everyday life? Have you ever sat and looked at an object and we can do this right now if you want to? Pick an object in the room that you're sitting in, any object at all. And as you look at the edge of that object, it could be anything. It could be your own hand, it could be a table. The object that you're looking at has a size and a shape. You can do this with internal objects of thoughts and emotions as well. Can you see that you believe on some level, unquestioned still, that at the edge of that object, something different appears, formlessness. Here's a form and then formlessness, that there are two categories. Because this is the most believed idea of all, even more believed in the fact that I'm a separate being, which is relatively easy to prove to ourselves isn't true, we'll still be believing in these final two categories, form and formlessness, that there is both of those things right here, right now, when in fact, form and formless are just two different ways that the same essential core consciousness can appear. It can appear as nothing at all, and it can appear as everything, something, but it is not different. There are not actually two, even here. And we can sit in satsang like this and we can contemplate this and we can have profound breakthroughs. And um, then, unconsciously, unknowingly, our habit will be to go back to thinking about a world that exists of forms and objects as we leave our satsang, as we leave our meditation, as we leave our inquiry. So this is why uh, these three essential things became so important for me. And <clears throat> if you really want to be free beyond all definition, all concept, beyond mind, out of the reach of mind completely. This last concept must also be deeply contemplated. Is this really a human body? Is that really a table? Is there a gap, a break in the formlessness? Could there be such a thing? Are there really all these infinite number of forms arising out of the self. And what does it mean if there isn't? If all of this is formlessness, as far as you can perceive, the planet, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, all of it, if everything that could ever appear is actually the formlessness looking like something, but not actually being that thing, then if you are that formlessness, if you've proved that to yourself in your inquiry, you can't find yourself as a thing, then the recognition will eventually hit you that you are everywhere, everywhere that there is something and everywhere that there is nothing is you. And this is not a far off, hard to reach understanding it's only hard to reach because out of default setting, our thinking goes back to reinforcing the idea of a world and all these objects and other beings in it. So this is as difficult to reach as an understanding experientially as we are willing to think about it. 
And part of becoming a sage or allowing the sage that's already inside you to come to the forefront is being willing to think about these most unpopular thoughts, these most uncommon thoughts. How often do you think the thought arises in a human brain? The thought that says, what if form and formless are the same thing? How often is that thought cultivated? How often does that thought become the dominant thought in someone's mind? Or the thought that I would really like to know beyond all doubt, beyond all scrutiny, beyond all, um, without any uh, capacity to doubt it anymore at all. As I'm saying these things, I just want you to check in case there's a feeling of unworthiness coming up. I'm not saying these things to say that you haven't done what you need to do. That's not what I'm saying at all. The fact that you're hearing these words is profoundly amazing because this is what's already occurring for you. But unless we cultivate that on purpose, what am I interested in? Am I as fascinated in the formlessness as I have been with form? Am I as fascinated in disproving this main assumption that they are two different things, form and formless. And I can tell you it's so worth pursuing this, not from an efforting struggle seeking, but just becoming so intensely curious about it. Because if you are intensely curious about what formlessness actually is, what forms really are, you have to find out. You have to. Nothing changes in your everyday experience. You still see the same things, the appearance of things that everyone else does. But whatever your eyes fall upon, whatever your ears hear, whatever you experience in any body that comes and goes for the rest of eternity will be experienced with that same depth of peace and equanimity and utter silence. Our mind can't really say anything about that thing because you know what it really, really is, or that being because you know what, it, what they really, really are. Anything that we're thinking about, the only reason we're thinking about it is because we still think it is what we think it is. It's not a riddle or a koan, it's if I'm thinking about someone, the more I think about them, the more they're going to seem like a separate being outside of me that I need to think about. The more curious I become about what they really actually are. Are they really the form that they appear to be? And we can do this as a whole with all forms. What really are all of these forms? Looking at the assumptions that we all take for granted. We all walk in every room and we sit down and we agree with this idea that there is empty formlessness in which the room is appearing. What if even that is not true? What if all you have ever encountered has been formlessness disguised as something? And how would that change your life? We all kind of have this um, well-established habit to think about things that we think are there. And habit drives our thought process. And we might have some epiphany and satsang, some realization in our, in our daily life. But then the habit of thought will go back to recreating problems about things that we think are there. Most of all, about the thing that we think we are. You know, being, being uh, worthy enough, being free enough, all of that. So what is the most... Uh, unpopular thought that your mind doesn't want to think. And why is that? Could it be some thought that says, you know, I don't really have any issues at all. I'm already free. There is nothing other than me. Formlessness is all there is. If we keep thinking the same way, 
we're going to keep having the same experiences. If we're willing to cultivate and um, foster habits to think differently on purpose. Our mind is really intelligent when we give it something really intelligent to think about. My mind uh, really enjoyed grasping a hold of trying to think about this formlessness and form. Are they two really different things? Could it be true that they are the same one being appearing as form and formless? My mind is like, whoa, that's so radical and really enjoyed thinking on purpose, really. <clears throat> and I'm, all, I'm not against thinking at all. But do your thoughts excite you? Are they challenging? Are you bursting through boundaries? Are you pushing through limitations? Or are your thoughts mostly the same old, same old, same old? And what about your thoughts about awakening itself? Are they mostly the same old, same old? I've still got further to go. I'm not there yet. I'm not worthy enough yet. And one or two thoughts that will be plaguing everyone right now. I can't know what Helen knows. I can't do what Helen's done or any awakened being. What she's talking about is too hard for me. I can't foster that habit. What are the thoughts that you're not challenging right now about yourself? Are you willing to awaken the Buddha within you on purpose? And I know you are, of course, otherwise you wouldn't be here, but I'm just trying to kind of light a fire or stoke the fire that's already burning inside. That the mass collective habit of human beings is to think about illusion. And we're trying to turn that tide here to think about what is actually real. Just because it's what is real doesn't mean it's popular to think about, even for us here in Satsang. I had to foster this within my own self. <clears throat> I had to come to a point where I was um, willing to spend some time each day thinking about things that were unfamiliar and unpopular until they became exciting. And there is so much waiting there for you when you begin to think like this. You'll feel alive again. You'll feel passionate again. You'll feel excited. You'll make friends with your mind again because it won't just be running off doing its own thing. You'll see it's actually a really good tool when we can direct it. When it's not directed, it goes back to its autopilot settings. And there is nothing more exciting than the consciousness that you are taking the shape as a human being and thinking on purpose. What if every week you got together with three or four Sangha members and had a discussion like this? Like, What thoughts are we still believing? What thoughts does every human being believe? What can we challenge today? And... Uh, your life would turn around. <clears throat> and the more you foster this habit, the more your mind will go there by itself on purpose anyway. We just have to um, be a little more conscious of where our thought process is going. Did you know that you can have a thought appear spontaneously in your mind that says, I am all there is, and it will feel true. We must open the doorway for that. You can also have a thought that says, form and formless are two synonyms, and it will feel shockingly true, stunningly true. It doesn't matter whether you're showing up as something or nothing or everything. Your experience is the same same, same. Whether I feel like someone today, whether I feel like nothing at all, the vast emptiness of being, or whether I'm deeply in love with all of creation, feeling like the addict, identifying as everything, I will feel the same. So I'm not talking about some faraway place here. What reality actually is, what you actually are, 
the place where there is only one, there isn't even the two of form and formless, is not hard to reach. It's hard to get the attention to go there on purpose only. That's the only hurdle to overcome. And as human beings, we have a choice in every moment what we focus upon. And I hope that that has inspired you to kind of go to places within your own consciousness that are not really often tread. That is the purpose of satsang too. At least every time we're in satsang to go to these places inside our own consciousness where we're thinking about things that we don't normally think about. <clears throat> and that's great. What if we start to do that on our own too? When did you last sit by yourself or with someone else and think about this? And again, no fault, no blame, just recognizing that my habit, my default setting is currently set to think about other beings and other things. And that's the case for all of humanity, isn't it? And that's why we have satsang to kind of remind us of what we need to be reminding ourselves about. <clears throat> so I hope that has kind of um, struck a chord somewhere, <clears throat> excuse me, deep inside, some kind of chord, or lit some fire, or turned up the heat on that fire. You have so much inside you, so much. Infinite wisdom, peace and joy available but they must be kind of sought out inside, not seeking as in efforting, but directing attention on purpose. Whether that's just being the emptiness of our being, being the formlessness, or deep in self-inquiry about what this object that I'm looking at or thinking about really is. It's always up to us, always. If you grasp that one thing, you'll be right back in control of your awakening. That's the message I wanted to get across today was really that, that you are in control. It doesn't need to take a long time. It will take as long as it takes to direct your thinking on purpose, to become really interested. A sage is really only one that has challenged the thoughts that nobody else challenges. And that could be you today, couldn't it, right now? That could be you right now. Am I really sitting in a room with all these other things, listening to some other being talk about something? And how long will I spend thinking about that, being interested in that? And how quick does my attention get drawn back to something else, something more uh, trivial and something in duality? Nothing wrong with any of that, of course. But for a short while, we must maintain most of our attention on this to break through. And then we're free forever and you can think about whatever you want for the rest of eternity. Okay, so um, didn't mean to talk for that long, um, but apparently that's what's supposed to happen. So uh, I will uh, read a question that's been sent in. Um, Okay, so this one says, uh, hi, Helen, I think you have mentioned before that you overcame some health issues and dietary limitations, such as eating wheat through contemplating. Could you expand on this? As I have issues with certain foods, but I do not remember ever forming a belief, i.e. the intolerance came first, and it was only through observation that I could associate the symptoms with a certain food. I didn't decide to be intolerant to dairy, it just arose. So how do you undo these patterns? Same with illnesses. I believe we can try to undo these patterns through contemplation, but would appreciate some guidance. Perhaps you could do uh, a guided meditation on dissolving long-term health issues. I know you often use the question, is it really true? But if I ask, is it really true I have inflammatory arthritis? The answer appears as yes. Okay, so um, 
to again here is a thought that we uh have not uh challenged that we might not realize we're believing until it comes up in our experience so anything that's happening to the body like this like an intolerance to a certain food like a condition or a disease or an illness if we begin to think about it differently it's going to get clearer and yes, using contemplation can help alleviate these and heal these, but not contemplation on what's going on in the body. If we begin to, the, the, the popular thinking as a human being is that the illness, the disease, the intolerance is the main issue. And I have symptoms of that main issue. So with arthritis, for example, I might have pain as a, as a symptom and arthritis is the cause. But to heal these permanently, I'd like to be, suggest that we change our thinking, that whatever I see appearing in the body is a symptom of something uh, more original to that. And of course you said that about beliefs, but not beliefs about what's going on in the body. So my intolerance to certain things I saw was a symptom of some belief that I was holding on to, something that was before and uh, beyond even this. It's showing up in this body-mind vehicle as an intolerance or a disease or a condition or an illness. But that is a symptom of some deeper held belief about myself or the world that I'm holding on to. So not questioning, is it really true? I have inflammatory uh, arthritis. But using the symptoms, the body is showing you symptoms of some dis-ease higher up in your energy bodies, something that is before even physical form that's being believed. So what are the emotions that you feel around this illness? Because they will be indicative of the story that's being believed that the arthritis is a reflection or a symptom of. Again, just turning around <clears throat> how we think about illness and disease. If we go to a doctor, and of course I'm not saying you shouldn't, but the doctor will say this illness is the cause and the symptoms are these things. And I'd also like you to look at the illness, the intolerance of the disease as a symptom of something else, of a symptom of an emotion that we keep feeling that we want to address somewhere inside. <clears throat> what does that emotion tell us in its purest form? So do you get angry with the arthritis? Do you feel sad? Do you feel um, unworthy that you can't seem to shift it? What are the emotions that go along with it? And what are the stories behind the emotion? What would sadness say to you if it could talk to you? What would anger say? If it could talk to you, what voice would it say? What words would it say to you deeply inside? Would it say something like, it's not fair? Or I feel restricted and blocked and powerless. What would it say to you? And that will be the cause of which the intolerance or the illness is the effect, the symptom, the reflection of. So contemplation, yes, and then asking, is this really true that it's not fair, that I can't move forward? Is it really true that I'm powerless? So just changing around the way that we think about this. <clears throat> and when I began to look at intolerances within my own self, I unmasked the uh, belief in there that I can't get what I want, that no matter what I do, I'm never going to get what I want. And, you know, I don't eat a whole lot of wheat these days at all, but I can eat it now without my body showing these symptoms. There's a healthy respect for this might not be the best thing for my body, but I'm not uh, in chronic pain if I do eat it. My food choices have changed also, of course, as part of that contemplation, but... Um, looking at what's happening in the body as a symptom of something before that, as a reflection of something before the body. And that maybe we have this body in mind so that we can 
see what we're still holding on to, track it back inside. This physical issue is showing me an emotion that I haven't really, really dealt with. I might have felt the emotion a lot, but I um, might not have contemplated the story behind it. So just sitting down with the raw emotion of fear or unworthiness or shame or anger, grief, sadness, whatever it is that we're feeling. And when we deal with it on an emotional level, it won't have to show up physically. When we deal with it on the story level, it won't have to show up emotionally. And that's the reason for having a mind and body so that we can see reflected back to us in our experience what we're still holding on to there. <clears throat> so I hope that one helps. Uh, lovely. Okay, so we'll go to Sylvia. Uh, we'll take up to three questions online. We've got two already. Whenever you're ready, Sylvia. Uh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Can you see? Ah, yeah, okay. Yep, there you are. <laughs> Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> It was a very beautiful talk. Um, thank you for that. And um, I would like to ask you if you can help me with something. Yeah. Um, I come to experiential understanding that, um, that there is no phenomenal, that there is only nominal. Yeah. Um, and there is a clarity that the sat and chit is one, but there is not yet ananda. <laughs> yeah. And uh, of course, I do understand that there is some kind of like a, a, a rewiring process that this body and mind need uh, to kind of get rid of all habits and and and, and, and tendencies. But I also. I heard you in YouTube, uh, some some clip that you were saying that even to Ramana it took three years to get fully uh, established in, in the truth. And there was uh, pure enjoyment and, and peace all the time. So I wonder, I mean, you are such a cream de la cream of the spiritual shortcut. So you can help me with this one, please. So, um... Yeah, as you, as you said, I'm always looking for the shortcut. And when, when, I, when I had this epiphany the first time that form and formless are the same thing, it seemed um, totally, it seemed, it seemed completely clear. And like, like any epiphany I'd had along the way, it seemed impossible in that moment that I would ever forget that again. Like, how could I... How could I have not seen this before now? And, you know, I'm never going to forget this again. But then, as I was saying earlier, uh, 10 minutes later, I'm thinking about some form that I think is there. And the rest of my day, I'm thinking about some form, form that I think is there uh, or some other being that I think is there. And when I began to recognize that, that I have this epiphany first, like, first of all, I might realize I'm not a separate being. And then I might have to apply that to my relationships. I'm not really separate to this person I'm currently having this argument with or in this relationship with, or I'm not really separate to my boss or my sister, or, you know, I'll have to apply it in my life. So this is, this is no different here, this one. I might have seen that form and formless aren't actually two, but I will have to apply that to the places where I really still think uh, that, that certain things do exist and that's just out of sheer force of habit of thinking about things and reinforcing the more I think about something the more real it's going to seem and outside of me separate to me and yeah. therefore the more I'm going to feel justified in spending time thinking about it that's the trap that consciousness gets into I think something is outside of me separate to me this form so I keep thinking about it and keep having the same experience with it. And therefore, um, it seems to make sense to keep thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So if I can remind myself in that moment or later or whatever, how, how much of my time am I just looking at? How much of my time am I still thinking about 
objectivity in general, forms in general. Mm -hmm. How much of my energy and attention is going into reinforcing the illusion still? And why, and why is that? You know, curious why. You know, what, what is that? And what would it take to come to a point where whatever my eyes rest upon, I can't really think about it because I know it's not other than me. Mm -hmm. That seems like, whoa, that's like a faraway place. But if you just become curious about that, why am I still going back into the old way of thinking about things? And you don't need to tell me right now, but you could probably tell me if you looked at your average day, if you go to bed tonight, there'll probably be three or four beings that you've thought about a lot during the day and three or four things, you know, so time, money, you know, <laughs> our romantic partner, you know, things that we think exist outside of us still. Mm -hmm. And those will be the only ones really that we have to spend some time convincing ourselves that they're not actually what we think they are. Mm -hmm. so taking that being and asking ourselves what they really actually are or is there really such a thing as money or time whatever I seem to need this thing thing that I need mm -hmm. asking what that is doing a little inquiry with that inside our own uh you know in your own time you could, and again, without, you don't need to tell us who and what they are but can you see the certain things that your mind habitually goes back to thinking about certain beings, certain things? Actually, I can see this quite clearly. Um, I did inquiry uh, on that, and um, there are two foundings that I found. Uh, first one is that this background is practically all the time there, but there are the moments when the awareness kind of choose to play still this, this body role, whatever it is. Yeah. So there is separation. And uh, it's really like kind of like a program in the head, which is uh, triggered. Then there is a certain pattern of the thinking and certain pattern of the repeating pattern of the acting. Yeah. And I can also see because having this clarity that in a time it will dissolve, it will be completely like uh, it will be gone. But every time when there is the choice to be pulled in this separation, it's kind of like, like if I would give this separate body and a vitamin booster or something, it's like, it's instead of slowing down, it's slightly pick up. So it's, I can see that it's take lo it will take longer logically. And the second thing that I have noticed is, uh, this is quite interesting, maybe I, well, I would like to hear your opinion, that anytime I am pulled into this separate self, uh, whatever action is there, or so the emotions, I feel that intensity of the suffering is much bigger experience mm -hmm. now than it was, for example, two years ago. And it's so kind of funny. It looks almost like, like awareness is playing game with itself. Like first they choose to be separated and then it makes it suffering so strong that you are immediately want to be pulled in the background. Yeah. Is there like vicious circle around, and I would like to kind of like break bring the, break this spell if, if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I remember that that I've seen so clearly that um, there isn't really any forms arising out of the noumenon, you know. And then to find myself thinking about things I think have arisen out of or other beings becomes incredibly painful. Yeah, and it kind of has to do in a way to kind of shock us out of this uh habitual going back there you know um going back into separation only for me when it became so uh unbearably painful did did I kind of foster this thinking on purpose that I've been talking about so I trained myself to kind of whenever I found myself going there about anything um does this really exist you know, what really is this? Or is this worth thinking about? You know, those kind of questions just stopped the thought process or began to turn it around more to thinking about. It was a recognition that if I'm thinking about someone, I obviously think on some level, I'm still convinced on some level that they exist outside of me, separate to me. 
that they're a real being, that a, a separate being that has arisen out of the self, just like I used to think about myself. Mm-hmm. So what's your question? When, once you realize you're doing that, you're going there, yeah. what's your question that's going to stop you? And this applies for everyone. And um, for me, the question, th- does this really exist? Okay. You know, it really just stopped me because um, un- unless we can find something that stops us, in the, then the force of habit will be to continue thinking about that being and we'll be lost for hours and hours and hours before we realize or until it hurts so much. So is there something you could tell yourself in that moment that's going to shock you out of it? For me, it was a statement. This person I'm thinking about does not exist. This person I'm feeling justified about being angry with okay. or resentful towards or this person I think has done me wrong, you know, or, or whatever is going on inside us. On the ultimate level, I have to remind myself that there's no point continuing thinking about this because I can never reach a conclusion thinking about something. I can never resolve this problem I think I have with this being by thinking about them as a separate being. It's just not possible, is it? So when mind begins to see even the futility of its own thought process, Mm -hmm. not the wrongness, but the futility, there's a difference there, isn't there? Yes, yes. What is most important that I can think, what's the highest thought I can have in this moment about this particular issue that I'm thinking about? I see that there is always choice. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's a choice, just go with the stream or whatever, play yeah. the role. Uh, and sometimes it's not, but there is, it feels like this choice is on me. I mean, like, like um, awareness, yeah. but it's like awareness enjoying still to do that. It's like, you know, when you, when you went to bed too late last night and the alarm goes off, you know, you should get up but it's just so much nicer to snooze, <laughs> yes. right? So much nicer. And you know you're going to pay for it later because you'd be rushing. But an awareness goes, yeah, I know I'm not really separate to anything, but can I just go back and play for a while with separateness? And it's just it's just doing that out of familiarity and habit, really. That's all it is, isn't it? But eventually there becomes this strong desire to, I don't want to do that anymore, not because it's wrong, not even because it's untrue. I just don't want to do it anymore. Yes, I think that's the thing that the, the the choice. But as I said, well, would you also maybe because it's it's also depends of the the um, of the pool. Sometimes like certain things doesn't pull me again uh, yeah. back to the. But then there are like tendencies of asanas that are still have a. It's much easier to be pulled into the person. Oh, yeah, you'd be, you'd be lost in something for 12 hours. You didn't yeah. even realize you'd gone there until 12 hours had gone by and you feel terrible. Yeah. And uh, you can't do anything about that, can you? Except for when you realize after 12 hours, in that moment, you then have a choice then, don't you? Yes. yes. If you choose to use that choice then to beat yourself up about what you've been doing the last 12 hours, you've lost that opportunity in that moment. It's like, oh, I'm back, I'm back. Okay, what can I do with my attention now? Now in this moment of clarity. Okay, that's the question. Yes. Yeah. Because I had before, I had a, like, oh, I shouldn't do this. Uh, it's not right, blah, blah, blah. But now I said, like, what's the point? It's just a game. Mm-hmm. But um, acknowledging, okay, that's that's a good tip. Okay, I can, I can. That's the one that took me forever to realize. If when I finally come back to clarity, finally come out of separation after days sometimes of you know, thinking about something, weeks, you know, sometimes. If I use that golden opportunity to beat myself up, then I've gone right back into separation again. I came up to the surface, took a quick breath and went straight back under again. Yeah. You know, what can I do to tread water a little while on the surface and actually breathe deeply and, you know, and what's the most important thought? So it helped me in those moments to have a piece of paper in my hand or close by or written on my phone, or, you know, somebody to talk to, to tell me what's the most important thing here. Mm-hmm. Is it going to be beating myself up over it, or is there something even higher I can do in that moment? 
And then as you to choose that on purpose, it will begin to happen by itself. More and more, you'll come out of it faster. More and more, you'll seem to have a choice as you're slipping into it, you know. There is something, for example, I am I'm reading your book, uh, workbook uh, about uh, forgiveness and uh, vasanas, which is, by the way, absolutely brilliant. Um, and I just wonder whether would you, it's helped me a lot, really a lot. Would would you advise me to really do the work, like trying to, you know, understand and, and uh, dissolving these vasanas, all the emotion behind? Or would you rather go to, as you just said, there is a choice. You want to play the game or you want to watch the game? Uh, if I had a choice in any moment, I would choose the highest thing that I'm aware of spiritually, the most direct thing. And then if I can't seem to get there, I would go to looking at the pattern and, you know, some, uh, because the end point of forgiveness is the realization there's nothing to forgive. Yeah. And the end point of the Vasana is the, the karmic patterns is the recognition that I've been making all of this up. Oh. <laughs> right. You know, so <laughs> if, it, if you can get straight there, then great. If you can't, you might need to, uh, use some thoughts along the way to build a bridge you know some contemplation is because this really I, true i noticed that when i do this uh, work uh, sometimes it's actually pull me it's like strengthen them because i have to go back in the memories and, and and a picture and so maybe this what you said is maybe even better a shortcut than just if you can we can't always immediately go straight back to the infinite reality there's nothing other than me um but I would always be looking for the most direct route. And there, there does come a point where thinking about any karmic pattern just activates it again. Yes, yes, yes. that's the right <laughs> so, <one. laughs> Which is back to where is my attention? Um, is my attention on a place where this karmic pattern doesn't exist? Or am I in the pattern trying to solve it and come out of it? Which of course we all do for a very long time until we realize it doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, that was fun. Wonderful. Me a Very useful conversation for everyone, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sophie? Hello, Helen. Namaste. Namaste. How are you? I'm good. good, good. Happy New Year. Good Happy to New see Year. you. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, it was a wonderful conversation just now because it was uh, co covering a lot of what I what was moving in me from from this morning and I wanted to kind of follow on yeah um so um I don't want to uh repeat and I, I haven't got it as as concise but um okay uh it's so yeah I'd say that the recognition of form and formlessness is like a um uh, a remedy for for suffering I mean even just this morning I was wrestling with this pain in my body and I immediately saw that there was the part that was pushing it away was also just appearing on this um, um, in the presence and that both of them weren't were just coming from that and so there was this immediate letting go of that and um so there's this relief and and that's significant there isn't it just to jump in quickly that when i see that the the one resisting the one suffering the one pushing against is also just a shape being made in the formlessness by the formlessness yeah. you can't really push against it so hard then can you no and so the whole conflict then starts to kind of relax even though it yeah. and um I found this over Christmas because it was like being with your family bless them yeah, it's often an interesting and, time isn't it spiritually yeah and I was staying with my mother for three days and um what 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 happened was that um it was actually a lot easier than than ever before because the shift was in me having even this sense that somehow it was subtle it wasn't like I was 
doing lots of practice or anything. It was just very subtle knowing that whatever she was appearing as, and she wasn't any, well, she was different. That's the interesting thing. Like life sort of started to change because I wasn't holding a position because that position was this easing of this conflict that was because it was both appearing. So what was kind of really curious was like, well, somehow that then diffuses that, um, that, that seeming duality or whereas because I had a position, oh, my mother is like this, or I'm like this with my mother and we have this. This is how we're going to be when we get together. Yeah, exactly. And that was, even though there were kind of moments of that, it couldn't sustain itself because yeah. either I, I don't quite know why I wasn't feeding it or I wasn't thinking about her. Actually, I think that's the key. Like you were just saying, I, I wasn't. I didn't hold an image of her as, oh, that's who she is in relation to You were to actually me. experiencing her and you were actually meeting each other, maybe for the first time ever, with, with brief moments of thinking about each other popping back in. But when consciousness is just done with that and it doesn't want to do that anymore and it gets a taste of the, uh, you get a taste of the freshness of meeting someone as they actually are, it becomes quite addictive, doesn't it? Nice and peaceful and... And um, then when you find yourself going the old way again, it's, it's much easier to just, I don't want to do that. Yeah, it felt too painful. Although there wasn't, there was this image of like, well, now we have to have a meaningful time. And there was nothing meaningful in any of it, in a sense, you know, there was no like. It was all there. meaningful on another level, wasn't it? It was exactly. authenticity, yeah. Yeah, but not like now we're really sharing or having a really deep conversation. It was just being in her energy what without be, reacting. You know, what could be deeper than actually being with someone, actually being with them, actually meeting them? That's the intimacy that we've all been craving, isn't it? You could be talking about a loaf of bread or what happened yeah. on Coronation Street last night. It doesn't matter, does it? It's just I'm here with this being and there's a beautiful freedom and authenticity in what we're experiencing right now. Neither of us is forcing the other one into a shape. And it's just as it is right now and it's beautiful. Yeah, it's kind of like looking through the form so that there's a recognition of, of the same. Yeah. So there isn't that. Um, so that's why it's really strange. It sort of doesn't matter how they are appearing. Absolutely. Regardless of whatever. So, so then it's like, uh, I don't know, it, it was like what you've just been saying about the thinking and everything. It kind of feels like, um, I don't know, uh, I was getting a little bit um, like, oh, is... <sighs> That just in that little dilemma of it being, uh, I suppose, a good enough thing or something was coming in to sort of say, well, is it because you can access it here and now just in, you know, just in presence. So there's this it's like, well, do I have to think, try and get well, my just, just be old, old thought patterns will come back every now and again to try to get you to play with them because here's a being that you might have uh, sought um, worthiness from or approval from or something like that, you know, and uh, the old thought processes will just try every now and again. Yeah, but you should be seeking approval from this person or something, you know, it's not mm -hmm. some part of our minds is it's not enough to just be with them. But so you'll notice that trying to pop back in every now and again for a little while until you've, you know, it, it just falls away out of lack of use, that thought pattern, eventually. You know, mind will suggest it because it's it, that's the way it works. But as you just fall in more in love with just being with that being, because you tend to feel worthy then anyway. You tend to feel complete then anyway, validated uh, anyway, not through anything they're doing or saying, just the fact that you're, you're being authentic in yourself. You're being whatever you are in this moment. You can't do that and not feel worthy and complete and validated, mm. can you? Mm. 
just at time to time, especially with our parents, our siblings, people that we spend large parts of our life with or all of our life with, knowing at least. Uh, we've all had these habits of ways. This is a person that gives me a sense of safety. This is the one that gives me a sense of approval. And I've got to try to get that from them. And it's just sort of noticing that when it pops up again and just gently stepping away. Yeah, I'd rather not do that today. I'll just be here and see what happens. It's lovely, isn't it? It's lovely. Yeah, and it is love. It is lovely because it's love, but it's very understated. That's the thing. It's like uh, just a kind of gentle, a gentle, like, and, and then there's more acceptance of that that appearance so even though that there can be it can be painful um talking to someone who's in pain or but then that again that's my um, as you see the more authentic i am in any moment the less i'm taking a shape making a shape of myself that has to affect and empower the other person also like you experience with your mom yeah. It has to be different with them too. So the best thing I could do for anyone in any moment ever is this authenticity within my own self. And um, whatever they're going through, whatever they're appearing as right now, I'm doing the best thing I can for them by just letting them be that. Yes, I might, of course, have a desire also that they stop suffering, of course, but that's also my own. I'll let my own desire be felt too you know, but I don't have to push against them to, to make that happen. I don't have to try to change them on some level, do I, to make that happen. Just my desire is doing incredible things in that. My desire, my authenticity. Yeah, and that authenticity is like the, um, like the formlessness. It's like the base of the formlessness. So it doesn't have... A preference as to the suffering either way and, and there's a recognition that although it may be unpleasant or whatever that being is going through they feel that they're suffering in that moment there's a recognition that they're not actually because they're not actually what they think they are yeah they're not actually their body and all of that and of course you know you wouldn't say that to most beings you can say it in a conversation like this but as you remember that they are not what they think they are also. And you're just gently broadcasting that to them silently. Then their experience has to change also because they are you. Mm. You know, and that's why we love being around awakened beings. We, they're not forcing us into a particular shape or category or anything, you know. Sorry, actually, the person I was talking about is just ringing, which is quite <laughs> interesting. Coincidence, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Wonderful. Good conversation. Yes. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we'll leave it there for today, uh, for today's satsang. Thank you very much for joining me. Namaste.